The only constant in life is change. Heraclitus. This quote rings true on many fronts for the year that is 2020. The world and everyone in it has experienced situations that will be retold in history books. Constant change, constant stress, isolation, upheavals in economy, social status and within our very own homes will take its toll. So today we are doing something a little different on the Heal Thy Skin podcast. We are speaking to four thought leaders from different backgrounds and asking them about the constructs on happiness and well-being. You will hear from Byron Dempsey, founder of the Driven Young podcast, Anna Block, an accredited nutrition and wellness coach, Benny Wallington, a performance coach from 101 Tokens, and Joanne Wilson, a neuropsychotherapist and relationship specialist. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It certainly was enjoyable for us to put this together. And even if you get one nugget of gold from listening, I'd love for you to share this episode. You never know who may benefit from it. First up, we hear from Byron Dempsey. Byron is the founder of Stream Digital Marketing and a podcast host. Byron is determined to help change Australia's education system for the better. He does this through his podcast, Driven Young, where he helps educate and inspire the younger generation with practical life skills that they don't learn in school. I started by asking him what he thought was the biggest misconception about happiness. The biggest misconception about happiness, I find, is money equals happiness. And so, I feel that's a huge misconception, especially for the younger generation when we have no money in high school. And so, you think, oh, if I get money, if I get something I don't have, then I'm going to be happier. And that is true to a degree. But like, I think it's just what, you know, money is important, but it's just one, you know, piece of the pie when there's so many other things that actually contribute to proper happiness. And so, I still remember when I was younger, wanting the PlayStation or wanting the next game. And I was like, I'll just be happy if I get this. And you are happy, but after leaving high school and starting to earning some money, it's like, yeah, it does not equal happiness at all. Next up, we asked Anna Block on the biggest misconceptions about happiness. Anna is an accredited nutrition and wellness coach, and her work focuses on creating well-being using a positive psychology coaching approach. You'll be hearing more from Anna later in the episode about the three constructs of happiness. I guess the biggest misconception is that happiness is usually confused with well-being. So happiness has three elements to it. Positive emotion, engagement, and meaning, which feeds into your life satisfaction. And these are actually all subjectively measured in the theory of authentic happiness. So well-being, on the other hand, is a construct which has five measurable elements to it. So there's positive emotion, of which happiness and life satisfaction are all aspects there's engagement there's relationships meaning and achievement and there all of those things can actually be subjectively and objectively measured so I actually use something called the PERMA model which is a scientific well-being framework with my clients developed by Martin Seligman so he's kind of the founder of positive psychology which is a scientifically measurable way to to measure a lot of aspects of well-being and happiness. So it's more of a science-based way to identify the exact measures of happiness, where someone's at, and the specific tools and, I guess, practices that will make my clients happy per se, but also feel good, feel fulfilled, and function effectively both you know, at work and at home day to day. Benny Wallington described the biggest misconceptions as an increased focus on finance and wealth. I think it's probably centered around finance. I think that's kind of the biggest thing that people associate having financial wealth in this instance as the key to happiness. And while I think it is important for a lot of things, it's definitely not the most essential. It's usually this sort of stereotypical example of you go to a third world country and there's more people smiling there than that you would see on the main streets of Melbourne and Sydney. So it's kind of a clear, obvious example of why financial wealth doesn't necessarily lead to happiness. 
You're going to want to listen to the rest of this episode to hear how Benny helps his clients be in flow. Benny is a performance coach with the Flow Genome Project and also runs a company called 101 Tokens. It's all about taking control of vices. He is passionate about discussing addictions and how finding one's flow is essentially where joy and happiness live. The key indicators of happiness can be subjective and will change depending on who you are speaking to. So we asked our next guest how they measure happiness. First up, we asked Joanne Wilson, a neuropsychotherapist, relationship specialist in a private practice, a columnist, and a podcaster. Basically those three areas, and what we're trying to encourage people if I was to look at depressive and anxious symptoms, which are very prevalent right now in this environment of a pandemic, is we need to access the smart brain as much as possible. So we need to go forward from your emotional brain, think of it like a train station. So we need to go on the fast track to the front brain versus going into your survival brain. We need to head into your survival brain. That puts us and spurs us into action. As I mentioned before, that's going to, if you smell something, you're not going to eat it if it smells off. If you smell fire, it's going to help you run away or go and fight the fire or save people. But we also need to be, if we spend too much time thinking anxious thoughts in day-to-day life, such as I'm not good enough or we're all going to die of this pandemic or whatever Fred down the road says about this illness is completely true and you ruminate over that, it's really hard to, and then you go down. So you spiral down into your body, your heart rate goes up, then you're facing stress responses at long periods of time. Too much cortical blood flow is going to restrict the blood vessels to your heart which then doesn't pump as much oxygen to the brain and you can't think clearly. So we need to be able to be providing our best sense of wellness and health, and which in turn improves our immune system by thinking smart thoughts, which is found in the smart brain in your prefrontal cortex. So really getting that healthy balance of what is true, what is right, and having that correct mindset that then brings forth happiness and a great immune system. Byron described happiness as who you are surrounded with and put a big emphasis on relationships. But I also think happiness is a big part of who you're surrounded by, so the the relationships you have. So there doesn't have to be romantic relationships, just friendships, uh, family relationships. I think that's a big part of happiness. I think for me personally, traveling and meeting other people, and I'm quite extroverted, so I like meeting people. There is a scientific model of happiness known as the PERMA model. Anna Block breaks it down into three elements. So the positive emotions, the engagement, and the meaning. So the first one, positive emotion, is basically what we feel. So, for example, we might feel comfort or pleasure or warmth, and that element defines enhancing the pleasure in your life. So without some sort of positive emotion, I believe that you can't really be truly happy. The second element, so the engagement, is about something that we call state of flow. So it's basically the moments in life when, you know, when, you, when you're so absorbed with something that you lose your sense of time or consciousness with something that you're doing. Yeah. So that's kind of that state of flow. So something that usually to get into a state of flow, you need to first definitely be aware and identify your, what we call character or your highest strengths and talents. And they're usually the things that you enjoy doing that naturally come to you. So I really like to position life around prioritizing exactly those types of activities and moments that create, I guess, more opportunity for my clients to be happy based on obviously their goals and their vision for their future. And then the last part of happiness, according to that model, is the meaning. So meaning is essentially a sense of connection, of belonging to and serving something that you believe is bigger than yourself. So for example, being in a family or a community group, it might even be, you know, for example, a religion or it could be 
a political party, but whatever it is, it's about having a higher purpose. And I guess concentrating on all three of those elements are, in my opinion, essential to cultivate a kind of a less fleeting emotion of happiness in your life. Benny Wallington also talked about flow. He calls it flow science. So flow is so beautiful in its kind of macro form, which is that surfer knows the feeling inside a barrel kind of vibe or the musician who just gets lost for half an hour while playing and then all of a sudden they're just going, oh, wow, what just happened? The thing with flow, though, is that it's all about practice and daily practice. Everything is your practice from your sleep to your nutrition to your movement to your connectivity with other people and connectivity with nature. There's all these basic practices that we can still do even if we are isolated, maybe not to the extent that we normally would, but what are the things that light you up that create a flow-based lifestyle? So if you're not getting sleep because you're worried, maybe there's a mindfulness practice that you can try and try that before you go to bed. There's so many different ways and there's so much information on the internet as well. Finding the good information is super important. But we can definitely, uh, one of my mentors, Jamie Will from the Flow Genome Project, he basically says that the practices that we do with a flow-based lifestyle is to put in guardrails. And we try and, and when the proverbial hasn't hit the fan, we usually, because our practices are so good, we're kind of cruising down the middle and it's, it's pretty good. But as we know with life, as we've known over the last six months, especially in Australia, the amount of things that have been thrown up at us, we can seriously smash into the sides. But with those guardrails up, by doing those daily practices, even amongst the chaos, even if it's just, you know, a five minute meditation, you normally meditate for an hour, whatever it is. And by the way, I don't meditate that much. So not on my high horse there, but just getting those practices in and making them simple enough that you can do them anywhere and any time, super crucial. I've often wondered about happiness and its link to motivation. Are we happy first, which leads to increased motivation, which further creates a life that we desire? Or does motivation, sometimes from avoiding pain, lead to increased motivation that drives us towards happiness? I asked Joanne what she thought. Well, we're always working towards pleasure and away from pain. You tend to, uh, how I was taught is that we are born with these alleles that some are bigger than others. And so you are, and that's passed down from your parents. And so you would tend to approach life and then that sort of gets into whether you had a happy and healthy mindset that was gifted to you by healthy habits from your parents. And so driving towards happiness, I talk in terms of approaching versus avoiding. So, and if you could imagine like a semicircle, and that is how your alleles are full of serotonin, that happy juice that makes us take an antidepressant, and that will force more serotonin into your brain. And so naturally, if you were to think of your parents who gave you the best advantage in life that were there for you, that helped you approach life, that if you're bullied or something bad happened at school or you, you know, failed a test or you had a friend down the road who punched you, that your parents were there for you to share the grief, to share those hard times, you'll actually have a semicircle that would be bigger to be able to juggle lots of life challenges versus the opposite where you would find yourself avoiding life challenges as an adult because your semicircle could be a lot smaller and you can't juggle so many of the adversities because you didn't have that support, that backing of a family unit that weren't there for you. As you could imagine, I'm working with so many clients that have been neglected, that suffered abuse, that just had negligent parents that for whatever, often passed down from their parents, they weren't equipped to be able to be there, to have their child's mm. back, that they were absent. Some of the clients I'm working with are very intelligent, like they're working all over the world, they're traveling everywhere, but they're not attentive to their children because they don't know how, because their parents weren't attentive to them. So those children often don't have a large semicircle with a lot of challenges that they can juggle. So they'll actually go down and avoid them and that they're the people that will spiral into depression, anxious symptoms, and they can't cope. 
So I guess what I'm saying, what drives, what motivates us is often where you've come from. That ability to know that I can achieve, I can overcome is often predetermined from where you've come from. Now, again, the great thing about this is neuroplasticity says that we can change how we think about things. We might not have been able to avoid before, but that's where my role comes in and many psychologists and psychotherapists, it is so exciting that we can teach and coach people to change that direction, that bog down car that was in avoidance can be redirected to a whole new highway that is in approach mode. Byron spoke about how millennials are driven by purpose, a very different driving force to what we call for boomers. And I know for a fact that millennials are, they do, they are much more driven over something that's purpose-led. So a business that's purpose-led and more often than not, they would rather get, have, get to contribute to something that they're passionate about instead of getting a raise or like in a bonus. And so a lot of businesses that I've seen, they'll start, you know, integrating giving as in like donating money to certain charities or climate change or whatever it is that these people are passionate about. And studies have shown that millennials are much more likely to be incentivized by stuff like that as opposed to an extra $5,000 or extra, you know, $4 an hour or whatever it is. Being in flow is a common theme for a feeling of well-being and achievement. I asked our guests how we can remain in flow when there's so much fear and so much uncertainty that we're feeling in the current state of the world. Benny used the analogy of a surfer enjoying the perfect wave. So flow is so beautiful in its kind of macro form, which is that surfer knows the feeling inside a barrel kind of vibe or the musician who just gets lost for half an hour while playing and then all of a sudden they're just going, oh, wow, what just happened? The thing with flow though is that it's all about practice and daily practice. Everything is your practice from your sleep to your nutrition to your movement to your connectivity with other people and connectivity with nature. There's all these basic practices that we can still do even if we are isolated, maybe not to the extent that we normally would, but what are the things that light you up that create a flow-based lifestyle? So if you're not getting sleep because you're worried, maybe there's a mindfulness practice that you can try and try that before you go to bed. There's so many different ways And there's so much information on the internet as well. Finding the good information is super important. But we can definitely, uh, one of my mentors, Jamie Wheel from the Flow Genome Project, he basically says that the practices that we do with a flow-based lifestyle is to put in guardrails. And we try and and when the proverbial hasn't hit the fan, we usually, because our practices are so good, we're kind of cruising down the middle and it's, it's pretty good. But as we know with life, as we've known over the last six months, especially in Australia, the amount of things that have been thrown up at us, we can seriously smash into the sides. But with those guardrails up, by doing those daily practices, even amongst the chaos, even if it's just you know a five-minute meditation and you normally meditate for an hour, whatever it is, and by the way, I don't meditate that much, so not a, on my high horse there, but just getting those practices in and making them simple enough that you can do them anywhere and any time, super crucial. Joanne uses a worksheet with her clients that can help with consistency, which can lead to a feeling of well-being. She shares it here. Dictate a lot of that about how you would approach or avoid this current pandemic, how you positively approach and discern what is true information and not be triggered into anxiety and spiral based on your normal approaches to stress. So I've done things like I created a a worksheet that can support people. It's really simple. It's just about really displaying something that you can put on your fridge that says, I will get up at this time and I'll go to bed at this time for consistency. The things that I'm grateful for, because when we're grateful, we have less toxic, less worrying thought processes when we're focusing on what is actually good right now. So those avoidance Mm -hmm. people are, are less likely to think of doing that versus the approaching people. So all of us, whether you've you come from a, a wonderful, enriched background, you can doesn't mean that you can't fall prey to toxic thoughts and fall prey to anxiety based on life experiences. So this worksheet I've designed is just prompting everyone who are two people that I can call on if I'm worried about something. 
who are two people that I can reach out to if I'm really concerned about certain information? What are five things that make me laugh? Like just remembering to step out of that worry mindset that you can ruminate and to so much time scrolling on Facebook or whatever and think, right, what's the five things I'm going to do to keep my heart rate up? That's the best antidepressant, best anti-anxiety medication on this planet. How can we make sure that we keep the heart rate up, doing something we love? Is it daggy dancing? Is it sort of doing push-ups in the backyard in the sun? What is it? So lots of little prompts like that that just help anyone to be able to cope with what's going on. Our relationships can greatly impact the way we feel. Joanne Wilson is an expert in relationships. So we asked her how we can retain our relationships at this time with staff, in intimate relationships, family, friends, and more in the context of difficult conversations and advice, simply more than just do more FaceTime, which we see kind of all over social media and the news. So I think that the first thing that comes to mind is something that I, if I could achieve this with every couple that comes into my office, is being able to assertively deliver feedback in a non-blaming way and for it to be received that way. So what I'm saying is that we need to have, for example, like we need, if you're with people in your family, that you need to have sacred spaces that you can work in and that you can have uh, allocated time to yourself and also supporting others in your family. What is it that everybody else needs and can you ask for that? And the non-blaming part is really important because often it can come out the wrong way when you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling concerned. If your thought life isn't particularly productive and healthy, it leaks out of us whether you like it or not. So one is great relationships are founded on the best version of yourself. So that's a whole new topic <laughs> that you can work on. But what we have discussed today is, is just that thought life. That's a really great start. And secondly is being able to communicate and ask for what you want. So one, don't ruminate over what you want and don't say anything. And two, don't be too assertive in fact, and that it comes across as attacking, as in you always and you never. One funny thing I often has suggested, like I put this in the worksheet, is introduce Feral Cheryl into your house, that she's that person who's very undomesticated, very selfish, and you can blame everything on her and hopefully the culprit will actually pick up on it and <laughs> attend to what the clothes that are being left on the floor. <laughs> but it stops at you externalising and blaming it on that one person. So, But I think if you could actually nail that part of delivering feedback, that's the best place to start. I do have a lot of friends that are working in management positions that are having to lay off staff or stand them down for the moment. And that is beyond their control, but how you deliver that and how you nurture them and how you give them options, how you resource them with really um, positive and healthy activities. And we all thrive on connectedness. We thrive on certainty. And two of those things have been taken away from most people. We don't know what's going on a lot of the time. We don't know when this is going to end and we can't physically touch the people or enjoy communion with them like we used to. So how we make sure that we do that is ensure yourself with a plan. So, yeah, make sure that there's those two people that you can count on that you can reach out to and choose two people that you can reach out to, such as health workers. How can you support them? Buy them coffee vouchers. The most beautiful thing I heard the other day was some kids in their street decided to be pen pals, so they wrote letters to elderly in their street in their letter boxes and said, we thought you might be bored. Would you like to be our pen pal? And <laughs> one of the elderly ladies started crying because it was just the most beautiful thing that she could have heard at that moment. Someone had passed away and she was connected with somebody. So there are so many inventive ways that you can connect in your relationships. And the biggest thing is that balance. So whilst you can connect with people over social media, make sure that you contain that and don't spend too much time there. So use the times on your phone. You know, there's all different ways that you can make sure that you can discipline yourself to keep phones out of your bedroom. But, you know, there's that real healthy balance of reaching out, connecting, but also having a beautiful amount of time on your own. And I think there's something a little bit bigger than this whole thing that, dare I say, to quote the 17th century French philosopher, Blaise Pascal, who said, the sole cause of man's unhappiness is that he does not know how to stay quietly in his room. And I think we mm. have lost the skill of being able to meditate or for many people to pray to be able to just be in comfortable with themselves on their own in silence. And there's so much to be said for the benefits of that in this crazy connected 
over committed world, we've lost that, in my opinion. As well as checking in on our relationships, Anna shared three tips on how we can feel less stressed and more productive. Yeah, so I guess I probably put it down to three key areas that in my experience allow I guess the right foundations to be put into place using an empowering self-help approach that I use with my own clients so the three areas would be managing your emotions your diet and sleep and and that way that you can control promoting feeling a lot calmer um, with a lot more clarity less brain fog and a lot more control over your day so The first one in terms of managing your emotions is really around, firstly, identifying your personal stress triggers, which the majority are actually unconscious. So 95% of your thoughts are unconscious. So resolving and identifying those, you can really start to manage your emotions and I guess resolve things like stress and anxiety for good. So approaching it from the source. One way, which I love to do, and you know, your readers might want to Um, experiment with something like this but it's actually diaphragm breathing so focusing on your breath is a really really powerful evidence-based tool to lower things like stress and anxiety and it basically works by engaging the part of your nervous system that rules your digestion so the parasympathetic rest and digest and it basically helps to down regulate the fight or flight stress response Another way that really helps manage emotions and supports you feeling a lot more calm and relaxed and positive can take the form of things like, you know, your meditation, deep breathing, carving out time to do things that you love. I was listening to an interview with Wim Hof uh, the other day. So, you know, getting into that kind of state, like the the breathing, the temperature, the ice baths, that sort of thing as well, which is really good for physiological impact on your stress levels. More and more, we are becoming more hyper-connected to technology, which means in excess. This is both a blessing and a curse. Benny Wallington helps people to take back control of their lives and uses their vices wisely. I asked Benny how he thought hyperconnectivity is affecting us, both good and bad. I think a lot of us don't, or at least underestimate the agency that we have as humans and the control that we can have over our phones and that connectivity. My work centers a lot on conscious consumption. I have a bit more of a cheeky term, which is vice optimization. So if you think about vices like alcohol, food, sex, our phones are probably one of the most damaging vices. But the reason I use the term vice is because in my opinion, a vice is cheeky and it can be negative, but it can also be flipped. It can also be used as a tool for, like you said before, I guess there's hyper connectivity if we're thinking about that in a negative sense, but true connectivity and connectivity with agency. And I think phones often say, phones are like the most brilliant or the internet and technology is the most brilliant information. We have knowledge, which is just unfathomable at our fingertips. But at the same time, if we're not vice optimizing, if we're not consciously consuming how we're using our technology, then it can be a portal to the depths of hell because we can get stuck there. And we all know about negative things that can go around on the internet. But I think as humans, we can definitely take more control over how we use our technologies Mm. and how we connect. So there we have it. Happiness, well-being and motivation from four leaders in their own space. If you enjoyed this episode, take a screenshot while listening and share it to your socials. Remember to tag us at dermhealth.co. I look forward to returning next week for another episode of the Heal Thy Skin podcast. Until then, be empowered.